Hi class! In this lesson, I wanted to introduce you to how energy is transferred through ecosystems. So first, let's take a look at some of the big ideas that I want to address in this lesson. I want to ask you about how do organisms grow and take a look at what is biomass. Then you will learn about what determines the productivity of an ecosystem, how many organisms can an ecosystem support. And lastly, you will learn about what are food chains, food webs, and trophic level pyramids. So here's that first question. How do organisms grow? How did you grow from being a baby into a teenager and then an adult? You might think, well, cell division. Cells divided to make more cells and that's how an organism grows. Okay, that's true. But where do you get the materials to make new cells? How do you accumulate new mass in your body? Well, hopefully you're thinking by eating food. When you eat food, you gain more mass. Well, but what about plants? Plants don't eat food the way you do. So how does a plant grow? How does it go from being a little seedling to a full plant? Where does it get all of the materials? You might think, well, by absorbing them through soil. Don't plants absorb nutrients through soil? That's true. They absorb some nutrients, some uh, nitrates and phosphates. But, you know, most of an organism is made up of carbon. How does the plant get new carbon to build new molecules? It's through photosynthesis. So a plant absorbs carbon from the atmosphere and incorporates it into new molecules. So photosynthesis builds new biomass. Plants will take the carbon dioxide that's in the air and then using water and light, they will make sugars and also other organic molecules. So they literally use air to build new materials. And then you, well, you get new biomass by eating plants. So like here's this deer that's eating plants and that's how it's growing new biomass. Now the best, the actual strict definition of biomass is just the dry weight of an organism. So if I wanted to know the biomass of a particular plant, I would first need to put it in a drying oven, dry it out, get rid of all of the water, just leaving the dry weight, and that's the biomass. And same thing in animals. Now in this slide, let's take a look how energy and nutrients move through the environment. So these arrows here, they represent energy. So it shows you which way energy is flowing. It flows from the sun into plants, they will use uh, the solar energy to build new molecules. And then animals eat plants, so the other, these other arrows are indicating the energy flow from the plants to one animal, then to another, to another, as they are eating each other. And when plants and animals die, they, they are decomposed by decomposers, so the energy then flows from each dead plant and animal in towards the decomposer. Now, there, you might then notice, what about these yellow arrows? What are they showing? Well, they're also showing energy, but they're showing energy as it's escaping, as heat into the environment. Anytime there is an energy transfer, it is never efficient. Some of that energy is lost as heat. And you've probably noticed this without even realizing it. Have you ever noticed that if you stand in a crowded elevator with lots of other people, it gets really warm? Every person is radiating heat out into the environment as they are processing food inside them. So with each energy transfer, some energy is lost on each step of the way. This overall flow of energy is one way. It is not recycled back. Once the energy is lost as heat into the environment, no organism can absorb it. So there is a one way flow of energy. Nutrients are a little different. They're not shown in this diagram. Um, let's take a nutrient like carbon. Well, carbon exists as carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It is incorporated by plants during photosynthesis. And then animals, 
get carbon in organic molecules when they eat plants, and they do cellular respiration, which recycles the carbon back into the environment. Remember, plants also do cellular respiration, so they will also recycle the carbon back into the environment. So energy has a one-way flow. Nutrients, are they cycle. They are recycled through the environment. The primary productivity of an ecosystem is determined by at what, what rate the producers of that ecosystem are making new biomass. So say a particular ecosystem has lots of producers, lots of plants or algae, and they are able to do lots and lots of photosynthesis to make new biomass. That ecosystem would be considered to be very productive. If an ecosystem has no producers, if say you're in the middle of the Sahara and there are just no producers around, then no new biomass is being made. If no new biomass is being made, then no animals can survive in that environment either. The primary productivity determines how many, producer, how many consumers can survive in an ecosystem. We are completely dependent on producers. There are two ways we can look at primary productivity. One is gross primary production, also called GPP. This is the rate at which the producers convert solar energy into biomass, into new organic molecules. It is basically the same thing as the rate of photosynthesis. So the more photosynthesis the plants are doing, they build lots of new molecules, lots of new biomass. And then this biomass is potentially available for consumers to eat so that we can, create, we can build new molecules, new cells inside us. However, not all of this gross primary productivity is available to consumers. Plants will take some of this biomass they just made and they will then do cellular respiration to break it down so they can use the energy for their own cellular functions. So we have to then look at net primary productivity, NPP. NPP is the gross primary production minus the rate at which the producers use the new biomass. So it's basically the same thing as photosynthesis, the rate of photosynthesis, minus the rate of cellular respiration within the producers. So producers will do photosynthesis, build new bi biomass, then use some of it in cellular respiration. Whatever is left over, that's the biomass that's available for consumers to eat. So the NPP determines the number of consumers that an ecosystem can support. And we can take a look at different regions of the world and how productive they are. So this diagram shows you for land, the more green it is, the more productive it is. And that, if you look at here, makes sense. Rainforests are very productive. The desert is not. And in water, the more red it is, the more productive it is. And it's generally really just the coasts that have the most productivity. There's uh, very little productivity in the middle of the open ocean. And now we get to food chains. A food chain shows the energy and biomass flow from one organism to the next. So it starts at the producer. Producers are the ones that produce new biomass. Then the energy flows towards the primary consumer. This is an animal that eats the producers. And then the secondary consumer is the one that eats the primary consumer. And a tertiary consumer is one that eats the secondary consumer. Notice how the arrows are always pointing towards the one that's doing the eating. The arrows point in the direction of the energy flow. So here the energy flows from the producer up until to the tertiary consumer. Now nature is usually not so simple. It's not just a simple linear relationship. So we actually need to look at food webs which show multiple interacting food chains. 
The way you recognize the producer in a complex food web is by looking for the one that has the arrows pointing away from it. So in this case, the phytoplankton are the producers. These are small microscopic photosynthetic organisms living in water. And they are eaten by herbivorous zooplankton, which is eaten by carnivorous zooplankton. So we have primary and secondary consumer. Now you might notice that in a food web, some organisms can be considered uh, to be at two different levels of a food chain. So this cod can be considered both a secondary consumer and a tertiary consumer. So just illustrates nature is not simple. And now we look at trophic level pyramids. These, the trophic levels show you at what level an organism eats. So one trophic level are the producers. Then the primary consumers are considered the second trophic level. So we have the first trophic level, the second trophic level, secondary consumers are the third trophic level, and tertiary consumers are the fourth trophic level. And I could, sh what a trophic level pyramid illustrates is the relative numbers or biomass or energy at different trophic levels. So if this was a graph, over here I would have the y-axis would be the trophic level. And then the x-axis could be either number of organisms or the relative biomass or the relative amount of energy in each trophic level. Notice how as you go up the pyramid, the number of organisms, the amount of biomass, and the amount of energy keeps decreasing. Why is that? Well, think about it. How many rabbits do you think exist in the world versus how many wolves? Well, hopefully you're thinking there's a lot more rabbits than wolves. Why? Well, each wolf needs to eat multiple rabbits to survive or, or other animals. So you always have to have more organisms at a lower trophic level to support the feeding habit of all of the organisms at a higher trophic level. So there need to be a lot more producers than animals and a lot more primary consumers than secondary consumers. Now let's take a closer look at the energy transfer between trophic levels. Now remember, earlier in the lesson, I told you that whenever energy is transferred from one organism to the next, that transfer is inefficient. Some of that energy is lost to the environment as heat. This is actually part of the second law of thermodynamics because that heat is a form of disordered energy, of entropy. Now the average amount of energy that's transferred from one trophic level to the next is usually only about 10%. And that occurs at each trophic level. So anytime uh, primary consumers eat producers, an average of 10% of energy is available to be used by the primary consumer. This also helps to explain why you get a decreasing numbers of organisms as you go up the pyramid. In general, there aren't, in most food chains, there aren't more than five trophic levels. There just isn't enough energy to um, support more than five trophic levels. So this is the end of our lesson, and I'd just like to leave you with one final question. So if, there, if humans have a limited amount of land and resources, what do you think is more efficient? Is it more efficient for people to eat plants or to eat animals and why. So think about that and I'll see you next time.